The world is a really big place. It is so big that some people question if it's even round since you can't even possibly see the curvature from most heights a human could visit. The world is so big that my beloved cat Bo can't even begin to comprehend it. Or so I think. It wasn't discovered that the Earth was round until about the 3rd century BC. This was determined by keeping time and observing the differences in the sunrays angles between two ancient cities. Eratosthenes was a chief librarian at the Library of Alexandria whose name I probably just butchered. What he noticed was that the angle of the sun between Alexandria and Syene, two ancient cities that I also probably butchered the names of and are approximately on the same meridian, had different angles of sun. At the same time of day between the cities, the sun rays cast shadows at a slightly different angle. This angle was approximately 7 degrees. Seeing as these two cities are approximately 800 kilometers apart and about 7 out of 360 degrees apart, we can say that 800 over 7 is 114-ish, and 114 times 360 is about 40,000. That would make the circumference of the Earth just above 40,000 kilometers. Of course he didn't use kilometers, he used stadia, because of course he's Greek, but it translates to the same thing, so I don't really care what units he used. Plus, as an American, I am legally obligated to not care about kilometers anyways. Or stadia, for that matter. Anyways, we weren't able to test out our round Earth theory until about a thousand years later during our first successful circumnavigation around the globe. This three-year journey on a sailing ship started in 1519 and officially proved the Earth is round. Despite our first circumnavigation being completed in 1522, we humans have tried to beat this record many times since. Who can do it the fastest? Who can do it without stopping? Can we do it in an airplane? Who can get eaten by coconut crabs the fastest? These are all questions that will be answered in the next 500 years by various aviators and navigators alike. All this record setting has since stopped after the Rutan Voyager set the most ambitious record yet. In a custom-built plane, Rutan and Jaeger became the first two people to circumnavigate the world without stopping or refueling. After this advancement, the record setting mostly stopped because any other records would undoubtedly be too expensive to pursue, while only being able to provide minimal advantages such as being like maybe a little bit faster or something, so for the sake of practicality, cost, and reason, this will most likely be the last circumnavigation record by plane, at least for a very long time. I mean, technically, the fastest circumnavigation would just be a low Earth orbit anyways, so there's no real point in beating this record. But, in case you guys haven't noticed yet, Flyout is not the real world. No one here is limited by cost, extreme design work, or even relative efficiency as shown by many of the community builds as well as quite a few designs of my own. So instead of traveling around the world in 9 days, I'm going to show you guys how I did it in 2 days. Through experiments math, and expert design qualities, I have constructed our marvelous experimental flying wing, the RV-02 Nomad. We don't talk too much about the RV-01, however. So in this video today, I am going to show you guys how I simulated a flight around the world without stopping for over two days. And yes, I painstakingly left the autopilot and my computer on for over two days to record this thing flying around the world, probably because I'm insane. But before we get into how I built and flew this thing, let's talk about what it needs to do. The RV-02 Nomad doesn't just need to fly around the world, but that is in fact one of the design goals. Including this and moving on, the RV-02 also needs to do so at speeds greater than 0.7 Mach, or high subsonic speeds. On top of this, I would like an operating cost average of under 100,000 an hour, including engine maintenance. This number isn't exactly low by any means, but it offers some level of sanity to the challenge. It's more or less just a goal to stay under. Because, you know, it's, it's a goal to make it, like, efficient to some degree and not just cook it across the planet in the biggest plane I could physically build. Although, that being said, she did get pretty big. Let's take a look at how on Earth we're going to fly around the entire Earth with this very interesting flying wing. So here it is, the RV-02 Nomad, successor to the failed RV-01 project I made a while ago. The Nomad has a few notable features. Mainly, you may notice it's a blended flying wing. Our goal was to get as much lift as possible. This combined with our quad boom vertical stabilizer setup led to a relatively low drag and high lift vehicle. And also, 
relatively stable. A combination of our high aspect wings and very efficient turbine engines at cruise speed also helped with this. The aircraft needed to cruise at relatively high speeds at the same time, however. Critical Mach number reduction was also a priority to keep our plane at low drag and high subsonic speeds. Staggered vertical stabilizers, engines, and sweeping the wings helped with this, along with giving us some extra elevator action. So let's jump right into it, and starting with what on earth I mean by elevator action. You see, the problem with elevators and flying wings is this. The center of pressure on an aircraft is often the pivot point. You guys know a little bit about pivot points in real life, so let's use a real life example, a door. A door's pivot point is the hinges. If you try and push on a door from the hinges side, it's very hard to open it. Or well, I wouldn't say exactly hard, but it's definitely harder. If you push on the side opposite to the hinges, it opens with ease. I can do it with one finger here. This is because the further away from the pivot point you are, the easier it is to exert torque on that item. So therefore, on top of the stability bonus, it would also be a lot easier for an elevator that is further back from the pivot point to pitch an aircraft up and down. This is because it can exert more torque on that aircraft on that pivot point. Ultimately, elevators pitch your plane by exerting a torque over the tail of your aircraft. Since a flying wing's pivot point and elevators or the object exerting the torque are often very close together, that can lead to some pitching problems with the vehicle. This is why a lot of flying wings have their elevators on the very tips of the wings where it is swept to the furthest back. This gives the ability for the elevators to apply as much torque as possible. Unfortunately, this has some drawbacks, most of them being in the structural stability of the wing. That's why on top of the elevators on the wing tips, which didn't actuate all that much, I included a large lifting body tail over the roots of the wings. This allows for more pitching surfaces at the root of the wing, where the distance from the pivot is pretty good, while not risking any structural factors of the vehicle. Towards the middle of the wing, the distance between the trailing edge and pivot point is minimized. This is where I would be putting the flaps of the flying wing. This is so when I deploy the flaps, the torque on the vehicle is minimized. These are not the only flaps though. To prevent the flaps from having any torque to pitch the vehicle down at all, a secondary set of flaps further down the wings was placed close to the leading edge. This allows for almost zero adverse effects from flap actuation as well as a reduced stall speed and a significant decrease in lift drag. So not only did they provide extra lift, but they also sort of acted like air brakes. All the while, the aircraft would not experience any negative pitch effects while this was happening. You can see the flap tracks on the bottom of the vehicle later in the video. Moving on from there, a question many people ask about gliders or flying wings or just vehicles designed to be efficient is most commonly wing shape. There are all sorts of different shapes from delta wings to straight wings and tapered wings, low aspect, high aspect, what does all of that even mean? And you know what, while we're at it, why do gliders and efficient wings have these really long skinny wings? Surely it'd be more structurally sound to make stubbier wings of an equal area. If wing area is the only thing that matters, then why not just make the wings stubby? And to this question I'd reply, while this is true, it would be more structurally sound, the lower aspect wings have a higher induced drag. And don't call me Shirley. So guys, what in the world is induced drag? Induced drag is the drag on an airframe produced by redirecting the direction of the air. You see, as wings travel through the air, they change the direction of the air. This is how they ultimately generate lift, so the drag generated by this lift is considered a necessary evil. But these wings don't just generate drag over this middle cross section we just so happen to use in the example. They also generate drag at the wing tips. At the tips of these wings, vortices are generated. Now these aren't the same as let's say the intentional vortices traveling down the fuselage of an F-15 or Concorde. These vortices provide no lift advantage, only drag. Now these skinnier, longer wings provide less drag in more ways than one. Firstly, the skinny wings, or as referred to in the aviation community, wings with a high aspect ratio, have smaller wingtip vortices proportional to lift generated. This is because there is less total wingtip surface to generate these vortices despite all the same wing area. These vortices are also why you see winglets on the end of airliner wings. All the boundary separation as wings cut through the air meet rather turbulently at these tips, and the effect travels down the wing even away from the tips. 
With a lower aspect wing, the air is separated even further at the tip, which generates even more turbulence in vertices and therefore even more drag. But I'm not just going to give you guys an explanation. Let's put this theory to the test. Here at Messier's Aviation Design Bureau, we take Jimmy's life very seriously. So for today's experiment, we'll be converting a previous aircraft into a test vehicle. The test vehicle in question is the T-10 Tanager. This agile, advanced jet trainer was designed to give its pilots the feeling of flying a much more powerful jet fighter for a fraction of the cost. This very nimble trainer jet achieves a lightweight, highly mobile airframe as well as an outstanding thrust to weight. I'll provide a link to that video in the top right. Also, if you want either of these vehicles, hop on my server where I'll be uploading them. Links in the description below. But moving on from there, these listed qualities make it an ideal test vehicle for our wing systems, so we'll be converting one to test our wing shapes out at the Design Bureau. Take a look at these. These two aircraft have the same weight, the same wing area, and will be flying at the same speed. The aircraft on the left has lower aspect or stubbier wings. The aircraft on the right has higher aspect or skinnier wings, more like a glider. We're going to take off and compare the lift to drag ratio of each wing. Basically, the higher the lift to drag ratio is, the more efficiently it flies. I'll highlight the number on the flight characteristic sheet with a red circle. With all that out of the way, off to the test flights we go. Alright, here we are in the air. Both planes are flying about 100 meters off the ground at 220 miles per hour true air speed. What you'll notice is that the low aspect plane is flying with a lift to drag ratio of about 9 while the higher aspect plane is achieving approximately 12. As we all know, 12 is in fact a bigger number than 9. This shows that the higher aspect wings are more efficient. There are some drawbacks to the style however we should probably point out here. These drawbacks involve stalls occurring more easily as well as less overall structural stability. Also, you can lose some overall agility with your airframe using the higher aspect wings. Ultimately, however, none of these problems would affect our aircraft. So using these decisions, we would include an aspect ratio of greater than 6 on our flying wing. We conducted some in-flight tests of our vehicle and found that at cruising speeds and altitude, we could achieve a lift drag ratio of up to 21.1. Keep in mind that most airliners and long-range aircraft only achieve a lift drag of about 17 or 18, making this flying wing even more efficient at cruise. And that right there just about concludes the design choices of our blended flying wing here. Next up after that was the engines. The engines we're designing on screen here are four single-spool high-bypass turbofan engines designed specifically to perform optimally at subsonic speeds. Going into the transonic regime of above 0.85, their efficiency starts to significantly drop off. But otherwise, the incredibly high performance at low speeds meant that these engines generated an SFC of less than 1 gram per kilonewton second on takeoff, and an SFC of approximately 5.2 grams per kilonewton second at cruise. Those numbers probably just about mean nothing to you guys. They'll mean something later, but not now. Essentially, this is just insanely efficient, especially for each engine providing over 100 kN of thrust each. Due to the immense size and fuel capacity of this plane, however, we would certainly need all that thrust. The only drawback to these engines is their drop-off in efficiency past cruising speed, but considering the design of the aircraft and its maximum Mach speed limit of about Mach 0.88, it wasn't all that much of a problem. At this point, we had everything we needed to determine the range. With our cruise speed, cruise SFC, and cruise lift drag ratio, we could calculate our maximum range. If you guys are ready for me to butcher another name, we would be using an equation known as Bergeuet's Range Equation. Essentially, using this range equation listed, we can determine an approximate value for our aircraft's range. It's important to note, however, that this equation assumes optimal conditions and that these values will not change. For example, as our plane gets lighter, our lift drag may decrease with our AOA. Furthermore, reducing throttle due to fuel reduction may also change our engine SFC. On top of that, you have all sorts of other factors such as airspeed and wind direction and all these other things. So while this equation isn't exactly perfect, it's a very close approximation of the true range of our aircraft. So what exactly do all these numbers and letters mean? Well, let's start getting into it, y'all. Starting on the left and working our way right, 
Range, or r, is equal to velocity, or speed, over a number we are going to simplify to our efficiency coefficient. Essentially, it's just a combination of engine efficiency, gravity, and some constant. Basically, the higher the number, the less efficient our plane is. So range equals speed times our inverse efficiency coefficient, times our lift-drag ratio, which we figured out earlier, times the natural logarithm of w. If you're wondering, w is just our fuel fraction. Fuel fraction is quite literally how much of your aircraft's weight is just fuel. So if you have 70 tons of fuel on an aircraft that weighs 100 tons, your fuel fraction is 0.7, or just 70%. So let's take that equation and break it down into its smaller fragments. Firstly, it's velocity. Assuming all other values stay the same and our cruising speed goes up, our range will go up. Makes sense, doesn't it? Below that, we have our efficiency coefficient. All this is saying is that the less efficient our vehicle is, or sorry, the less efficient our engines are, the less distance we'll cover. That also makes sense. Next, we multiply with lift drag. This means that if our airframe is more efficient or has less drag produced for lift, we'll go further. Seems to make sense so far, right guys? And lastly, the only one that's a little bit complex, the natural log of W. Basically, it's saying that if we have a higher fuel fraction, we'll go further. But that natural log is also saying that we'll have diminishing returns eventually due to all the extra weight we accumulate. This all seems to check out to me. So we plugged in all our values on an online calculator for Desmos that the Wanderer on the Flyout Discord server helpfully linked me with and found what our total range would be. So plugging in our numbers we went. Our ground speed in meters per second was about 250 for cruising. Our lift drag at cruise was about 21.1. Our SFC at cruise was about 5.8 which was very efficient. And lastly our fuel fraction was about 0.62 on the complete product which I measured after the video. All things considered, this approximated a maximum range of about 89,000 kilometers. Remembering our circumference from earlier, this is just over two full circumnavigations of range. Like holy crap this plane overperforms. I could have probably made it either faster or cost less per hour to fly or smaller or just something. But it was too late now, so essentially we just had so much extra fuel I'd be sending a good portion of our flight above cruising speeds. But with all our calculations finally out of the way, it was time to complete the rest of the plane. Moving on into the rest of the aircraft, a surprisingly interesting feature of the Nomad's design was the landing gear. The wings, especially with soft joints being on, were not the most structurally sound due to their length and weight. Because of this, the wings would droop onto the ground when they were not supported. With the standard tricycle gear, the wings would scrape on the ground and take off, causing all sorts of adverse drag forces, damage to the aircraft, and potentially shearing the wings off. And that, as it turns out, isn't very productive for flying. I did find out, however, through that, that my plane flew surprisingly well with no wings, and maintained a greater than 10 lift drag as well due to its lifting body. Either way, I reckon we needed about 7 separate landing gear on this aircraft, the 3 tricycle on the fuselage, 2 support wheels on the outermost booms, and finally 2 semi-exposed landing gear with an aerodynamic fairing on the very tips of the wings. These 7 landing gears allowed for the wings to rest without too much stress, although ideally with hindsight I would have included another set between the booms and wingtips. And that just about concludes the landing gear of course, of which I'm sure you guys didn't find as interesting as I did, but hey. Moving on from there, we are just about complete with the vehicle's frame. As I am certain you guys know, however, that does not mean we are done. Next were some of the more fine details of the vehicle. Without a doubt, a sustained global aircraft such as this one would be taking some in-flight atmospheric data. Because of this, we included all of our appropriate air indexing equipment such as static ports, pitot probes, multiple static wicks for discharging electricity, GPS, VHF antennae, and other antennae for equipment such as the transponder, and of course, some finer details. After we were complete with that, we decided to decorate the exterior of the aircraft. This was a pretty simplistic livery that involved a two-tone white and some red trim and details around the olivons and flaps. Not too overboard, of course. This was an experimental circumnavigation plane after all. After doing the FAA-compliant nav, landing, taxi, and anti-collision lights, it was time for the interior. The interior was pretty dry, and I'll admit it was pretty rushed in this aircraft, but it included the basics. GPS, MFD, six-pack radio, landing gear section, and some other things. 
Also, the entire center console was dedicated to the autopilot panel, which was rather in-depth. I felt this was appropriate as their aircraft would probably be spending its entire flight on autopilot. I also focused on allowing the pilot and co-pilot to easily change seats, as there would be a full interior on this aircraft. This would include a bed for the co-pilot to take trips flying, also include a basic toilet, a basic room, and a basic desk for the co-pilot to write important navigation and observational information. The pilot seat and console were both designed to allow the pilot and co-pilot to switch positions and controls as quickly and efficiently as possible. Although such position changes would not be done without the autopilot and the aircraft in cruising configuration, of course. Alright, with all that out of the way, with our unique design choices, our math, our interior, and all this nonsense, it was finally time to fly out. I'll see you guys in the sky where I'll explain a little bit more about the aircraft as we fly around the world. Because yes, I recorded the whole process. See you guys there. Alright y'all, we are now on to the flying section of the video, and this is going to take some time. In real life, this flight took me about 49 hours start to finish. I'll tell you the exact value when I land, but I encourage you guys to join me in this challenge. If you want to build something and fly out, I encourage you guys to also try circumnavigation. The current challenge rules goes as such. At least one soft joint is required on the airframe. The operating cost needs to be under $100,000 per hour, and lastly it needs to seat two people. This is so that way they can take shifts in the flight. And of course, infinite fuel isn't allowed, and no like glitches are allowed, and no exploitations of like cost per hour on piston engines or anything like that is allowed. So you guys, if you want to, feel free to join me. This speed of about 49 hours, I'm pretty sure it'll be pretty easy for some of you guys to beat. As mentioned before, this plane was way far into the efficiency side of things and definitely could have gone for a higher speed. For example, if I made the airframe a little bit smaller, maybe used lower bypass ratio turbojets or turbofans, and designed it more for transonic speed, I probably could have kept it under 40 hours for this run. But alas, I did not do that. Also, you know what, while we're talking about poor design choices on this aircraft, I could have used the wingtips to minimize vortices and reduce induced drag. I could have fixed the landing gear on the wings. I could have restructured the wings to have a little bit more vertical thickness. There's all sorts of stuff I could have done better. So you know what, someday in the future, I'm probably going to change it again. But for any of you guys trying to beat this record, the time to beat is approximately 49 hours. But we have a lot of airtime here, so instead of particularly scripting anything, I'm just going to talk about a few other design aspects of my airplane or what it could have been, because ultimately, a circumnavigation plane is sort of useless. To give you guys an idea, this aircraft I built very easily could have carried, let's say, 60 tons worth of bombs and still made it halfway across the world and back. Let's say ICBMs didn't exist, this thing would be an ultimate strategic bomber. It's somewhat low operating cost, along with its very high payload capacity, makes it a pretty dang good bomber, especially considering it can literally circumnavigate. Instead of taking those bombs, if we move the fuel around a little bit, I'd also imagine that this thing could carry up to 100 passengers. Considering the blended wing design and the actual thickness of the wings was enough to actually have cabins inside them, we could do one of those wild concept aircraft that everyone saw back in the 2000s, like the, oh look, this is going to be the Boeing 797 and it's just some weird blended wing design. I mean, after all, they are very, very efficient designs, so I can see why a lot of people thought that might have been the aviation future. I was getting some really weird glitches with the wind in the flight, where sometimes if I open the uh, weather menu instead of the conditions menu, I kind of get them mixed up sometimes, so it would automatically turn on the uh, wind direction modifier. And that would sort of flip my direction, so I'd have to quickly turn it back off again. But ultimately, if you're wondering why I decided to travel 270, it's because at my current latitude, 270 is the direction of the jet stream. So therefore, if they were doing this, I got an increased ground speed, which, you know, vastly sped up this flight. Had I gone the other direction and fought the headwind instead, this flight probably would have taken me upwards of like 50 hours, and that's not very ideal. On top of that, I probably could have designed the engines with a little bit better high speed efficiency as opposed to low speed efficiency, and gone a little bit faster, but that would have also drained a little bit more fuel, so you know, you win some, you lose some. 
But you know what? The fact that this thing can do two full circumnavigations more or less proves that it was completely just way overdone, way overperforming. If I went for a lower temperature but higher diameter turbine, I absolutely could have gone for a higher speed and kept my, uh, what's it called, my operational cost low. Actually, that was another problem with this thing is its operational cost was actually very high. Like, it could have absolutely been lower had I gone for a higher diameter turbine instead. Like, yeah, these engines are very efficient, but they burn at like 1,400 degrees uh, Kelvin, which is pretty hot and approaching the actual melting point of the metal. And this, you know, drastically reduces the lifespan of the engine. And therefore, that's why the operating cost is actually so high, because interesting fact, in flyout, it actually takes the um, turbine maintenance costs and factors it in. So yeah, our operating cost for our fuel flow was actually pretty high, but it wasn't that big of a deal. I mean, in the in the initial phase it was, because when we were climbing and all that, we were above 100,000 per hour. But eventually, on the latter half of our fight, of our, excuse me, our flight, it dropped below $100,000 per hour. Hope this isn't giving you guys a headache. It is sped up rather aggressively. But yeah, and I have to admire, by the way, because it was uh, nighttime, I have to admire the skybox in Flyout when it was night. I think it's actually been changed since it uh it was first introduced, but it looks a lot it looks nice. And like the moon shots or the lunar shots with this thing also look very cool. You know, if I were to mod Flyout, uh the first thing I'd actually want to do is I'd actually want to find out how to modify the skybox because I'm trying to get a uh, space engine skybox rendering of the Messier 82 galaxy. And that's what I would put in here. <laughs> Because, you know, my channel is, uh, is Messier82 and all. Cool fact about Messier, I'm actually a gigantic astronomy nerd. I just never really talk about it on my channel because it's all airplanes. But, um, I know my channel's big and all, but if you guys haven't seen it yet, I encourage you guys to actually look up the Messier82 galaxy. The gravitational influence from Messier81 is actually kind of what excites the Starburst region. And er, just the whole concept of Starburst galaxies is very interesting in the first place. But I am getting a little bit off topic here, so let's go back into the actual flight. It came up on morning time, and by this time I think I had slept two nights in the flight. I ended up uh, basically immediately after this recording getting sick, and you may hear it in my voice this video, but I'm still in fact sick for this voiceover. I had to take uh, multiple breaks between recording it, that way my voice didn't go out on me. And unfortunately, that's why it took me a little bit longer than expected, and the latter half of this video is actually a little bit rushed. Sorry, I hope it doesn't affect the quality too much. But anyways, I also took some pretty cool screenshots and videos in this flight that I wanted to use for custom airfields in the future, which is just a little cool uh, cartography feature. But anyways, we are finally at this point coming up on the airfield. At this point, it was like 10 o'clock at night for me on the second day or the third day, technically, because I started it at night. I started it at night and I ended it at night. I started it at like 9 p.m. and then I ended it at 10 p.m. two days later. Um, I was like literally psyched to see that airfield. I think, don't quote me on this, but I'm 99% sure this is the first successful circumnavigation under these uh, qualities, AKA like no infinite fuel or anything that's ever actually been done on this flyout world. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if either LDM or the Wanderer beat me to it, but if it is, I'm just, I, w I was so excited to see that airfield. So, you know, we're making records and we're making history in this game, which is pretty exciting. But anyways, we came in for a landing here. There was a bit of a steep crosswind on approach, but I could manage it just fine. Before this flight, I ended up testing out the flaps and the landing characteristics of the vehicle so I could find the perfect approach speed and flare angle and all that, so I landed it pretty nicely. After configuring my aircraft for landing and basically putting ourselves on a nice little pattern here, I ended up extending rather far out because we were very high energy, very high altitude. We weren't at pattern altitude at all. In fact, we were way above it. Folks, if you're ever landing at a real airfield, don't do this sort of approach. We'll just assume we got some sort of special clearance for our circumnavigation flight. But this is generally a bad idea to come in like this. But we turned for base, we put our flaps out, and then we turned for final cut throttle and lined ourselves up for landing, and we were coming in. Unfortunately, on approach, you guys may notice that the actual timer in the top right is a little bit broken. 
It started measuring time a lot quicker towards the end for some reason. It may be a glitch with Flyo, I'm not sure. But I do know for a fact that um, our flight took somewhere between 47 and 49 hours. I think it was like 48 and a half, honestly, because I started at like, uh, I don't know, 9.30 p.m. and I ended at like 10 p.m. So I'm going to say 48 and a half. But anyways, we'll just assume that the flyout timer is correct, even though it is not, and that we officially came to a stop in the in-game time of 49 hours, 32 minutes, finally completing our circumnavigation. Thank you all for joining me for this video, and I do hope to see you all in the next one. We've got some exciting things coming up, and I'm planning on doing another KSP video if anyone's interested. See you all in the next one, and goodbye.